Are you going going live right now or what? Yeah, about yeah. to. Uh, but you sure you want the screen, yeah. right? So we are live now. I think we can go to go. Uh, can I? Um, we like to share the screen, right? Oh, so should, I, should I stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah. Can I kindly stop sharing? Okay, I can stop sharing and then let just let me know when it starts. Sharing. Hi, Ashutosh. Are you sharing? Uh, uh, Ranjita, you are here. Why don't you go ahead then? Okay, I, I can do yeah. that. Um, let me just share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Giri, do you want to? Yeah, okay, it's coming. Uh, go to the next. Go to the next. I did. <laughs> Sorry. Next slide. Huh? Yeah, one second. Good. Okay. Uh, and so, hello, my name is Gary Mundium. I'm on the ComsNet Steering Committee. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kieran uh -huh. Mukavili of the, yeah, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kieran Mukavili of Qualcomm. Uh, he's a Senior Director of Engineering in the Qualcomm Wireless Research Group, where he currently leads our systems, uh, Qualcomm Systems Research in the uh, in sub seven gigahertz for 5G. He is entering his 18th year at Qualcomm. He joined uh, 2003 and he holds more than 150 granted US patents. And he's been involved with uh, all aspects of system design, digitization, engineering and implementation and commercialization of a wide variety of, of key Qualcomm wireless products. He was one of the principal architects for MediaFlow. MediaFlow, as you may know, is was the first wide terrestrial digital TV broadcast uh, system that was deployed in the US targeted for handheld devices. It was quite revolutionary. He was also the systems design lead responsible for commercialization of the UMTS mode in, in Qualcomm premium tier products, the Snapdragon 800, 801 premium tier uh, products. He's currently responsible for our R&D effort, for, you'll pardon me, I'll say R because I'm also a colleague of Kieran's at Qualcomm. <laughs> He's currently responsible for R&D efforts at Qualcomm for FIMAX system design, standardization, and prototyping for all sub-7 gigahertz aspects of the 5G and our 5G new radio, so it's in the 5G cellular communication standard. And he also successfully uh, set up Qualcomm's first end-to-end -end demonstration uh, a 3GPP uh, release 15 compliant 5G NR uh, call. He received his BTEC from IIT Madras, MS and PhD in electrical and computer from Rice University in Houston, Texas. Gives me great pleasure to introduce him. I'm proud to say I've been collaborating with him for more than 20 years and I've learned a lot from him. And the title Talk, which, I'm, which I'm sure we all are looking forward to is driving the 5G technology evolution towards 6G. So please, Dr. Mokavili. Thank you. Thank you, Giri, for that uh, kind words and introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here, talk to you all about uh, 5G and uh, how the technology evolution is shaping up to take us towards 6G. Um, let me start sharing here. It just worked fine earlier, so hopefully it's going to be okay now. Do you see the sharing? Yeah. It is? Okay. Let's, let me make sure my screens are okay. Okay. Yeah. So thanks again. Uh, so the title today of the talk is uh, the, you know, Driving the 5G Technology Evolution Towards 6G. And uh, this is one slide that I usually like to start off with just to give a perspective of, you know, where Qualcomm has been and also the contribution of Qualcomm over the last 30 years towards uh, uh, the evolution of different Gs. It really started off for Qualcomm uh, going from 1G to 2G where, uh, you know, we first digitized mobile communications, we went from analog to digital. And then uh, with uh, 3G and 4G, we redefined computing by uh, bringing mobile broadband and handle compute to, you know, portable form factors. And really, you know, what's exciting now is with the advent of 5G, we're taking all these technologies that we developed for mobile to transform other industries. And uh, 
again, I think this is an exciting phase that we are going through in wireless as we are really increasing the reach of wireless and uh, we we'll look forward to you know, what we have coming in the next 10 years or so. So with that, uh, again, I uh, thought you know, this is going to be another really uh, you know, instructive slide. Just look at you know, how the evolution of technology has been happening. And in some sense, you know, this is a virtuous cycle that uh, you know, we'll see happening again and again for every G in particular. You know, this is, of course, shown for 5G, but then really this is what 6G is also going to go through. So I would say, you know, it, it really all starts off with uh, a vision where, you know, you have to go identify a real problem, a good problem to solve, which is, you know, again, has to be a problem which has a far-reaching consequence. And for instance, you know, when we started off 5G, that was one of those things. And how do we take, you know, what 4G was able to deliver and uh, really, try, you know, crank up every single metric and KPI by a factor of 10? And how does that network look like? And then uh, the next phase is the invention where, you know, you look at the problem and then start coming up with possible solutions of uh, how do we address this problem? What is feasible? What can be done? What can be implemented? And then uh, the proof of concept. This is exactly where we go build prototypes because it's always one thing to go do simulations and, uh, you know, uh, show it on slide where that, you know, this is a design paper. But then uh, really the proof is in the pudding and... Uh, Especially, you know, for us, when we go build products, it's really important to first go make sure that, you know, the concepts that we're talking about, the new technologies that we're talking about do actually work. So that's exactly where this proof of concept phase comes in, where uh, we have our teams that build prototypes using FPGA platforms and other platforms and uh, show that, you know, what we're talking about actually works. And then comes the uh, really crucial standardization phase where, uh, you know, to be able to take the solutions, uh, to market and to be able to build it at scale, we need to make sure that uh, we are able to work with uh, the entire industry and we need to have a common language that we all talk and that's where standardization comes in. And for that matter, most of you know uh, the seller standardization happens within 3GPP these days, even though there are other standards institutions that also work very closely with 3GPP and uh, feed off of 3GPP as well as feed into 3GPP. So that happens quite a bit. And then uh, the trials and the commercialization phase where, uh, you know, once we have the standards done, we have to now uh, take these early products, go into the field, make sure that we have the right configuration to work with because, you know, when we standardize, there's so many options that we put in there just because, uh, it's, you know, there could be a wide variety of scenarios. But then really, you know, uh, for an operator of interest or for a scenario of interest, we need to make sure that we have the right configuration put out there and then that works and that's delivering, you know, what we had expected from, uh, let's say, system simulation. And then finally, the commercialization phase. So this is exactly what uh, 5G went through. I would say, you know, we started off uh, the vision phase is, uh, sometime in around uh, 2011, 2012. And uh, now here we are at uh, the commercialization phase. And, uh, you know, the wheel is spinning and now we are talking about the same set of steps uh, for 6G even as, you know, 5G commercialization is going through. So with that, uh, yeah, let's get to 5G. And uh, so, you know, just taking a step back to look at uh, what 5G was envisioned to do. You know, if you were to capture it in one bullet, it was really supposed to be a unified, more capable virus platform, more capable than what, more capable than anything that there was before 5G, 4G, 3G, and all these other things. And then you'll see that, you know, in terms of the requirements that we had put down in designing 5G, uh, you know, future compatibility, you know, which is, again, in itself very hard to define, but uh, just to make sure that, you know, the platform itself can exist for a long time and also take in, uh, you know, a lot of emerging technologies uh, that come along. So that, that was always one of the goals of 5G. But then, at, again, at a high level, uh, uh, so one of the key requirements for 5G was that it should be able to support diverse set of services. So we can again think of, you know, three main kinds of services, enhanced mobile broadband, massive internet of things, and mission critical services. And all of these need to be served on a single network. You could have different set of devices, but the network on a given spectrum should be able to serve all of these needs. So that was one of the requirements. And then diverse spectrum, uh, even as, you know, 5G is coming along, uh, you know, 
we had uh, enough technology demonstrations to prove that we can actually build a cellular system both at mid bands as well as high bands in millimeter wave so uh, in addition to the low band so that was one of the requirements to have a common air interface that could work across this collection of uh, diverse spectrum scenarios and then also with uh, different uh, licensing scenarios licensed shared unlicensed uh, and then finally the diverse deployments and it could be a public network private network enterprise network want to have a common unified solution that can be made to work under all these scenarios and then uh, the other key metric as i had mentioned was to really crank it up and make sure that we at least get an order of uh, magnitude improvement in uh, you know most uh, user uh, observable metrics like uh, you know throughput latency uh, and then of course for the operators you know spectrum efficiency and traffic capacity so so this was a vision of uh, 5g and then uh, how are we doing on this vision so so i guess you know, the first thing is we're really excited about you know how the commercialization is going on uh, so qualcomm in particular you know really pushed hard to get the commercialization going almost a year ahead of schedule so it started off in 2019 where we had a first generation of products and uh, similarly the networks are also taking shape uh, and now we are already on our third generation products in uh, 2020 uh, and then again from a uh, networks point of view and deployment point of view uh, 5g it's already been deployed uh, and it's going through deployments the network itself uh, of course you know as spectrum becomes available in uh, different regions of the world uh, operators are uh, bringing it up as we speak so in fact in terms of uh, adoption compared to any other g and in particular compared to 4g 5g adoption has been really rapid so so that's one part of it so what's getting deployed right now is mostly emvb and as mobile broadband uh, for extreme broadband really uh, but really our vision is also to bring in this other use cases and uh, we're extremely confident again just looking at you know how the landscape is shaping up that uh, you know these are the scenarios that we're talking about uh, are all uh, just on the horizon uh, once uh, extreme broadband takes shape so with that uh, so let's start taking a look at uh, you know what the technology foundation of 5g is what is it that really enables you know this kind of a uh, unique capability of 5g for a unified framework so it all started off with uh, 3 pp release 15 which is the first release that uh, defined 5g and uh, gave all the building blocks uh, that were needed for 5g and i would say again you know we listed out five of those here and uh, these in some sense are the real foundation blocks of the building blocks on which uh, 5g is built and uh, what really enables 5g to be able to operate across the diverse set of scenarios that i talked about in couple of slides back uh so the first one is a flexible slot based framework where you know same framework uh, uh for mid band at 30 kilohertz sub carry spacing of 15 kilohertz so sub carry spacing for uh low band and then uh, maybe 120 kilohertz sub uh, sub carry spacing for uh, millimeter wave all of that along with scalable numerology so this becomes important because you know you want to have a single modem implementation that can be made to work across all these scenari- scenarios so that's exactly you know what 5g is able to do and then uh, advanced channel coding so we have uh, ldpc codes and polar codes ldpc codes in particular uh, that's a big step up uh, compared to you know what we had in uh, 3g and 4g with turbo especially because you know for the kind of uh, throughput that we're talking about here it's it's very important to make sure that um, you know we're able to get that at a good area efficiency power efficiency and latency and all of that so ldpc is uh, is key over there and then uh, massive mimo uh, so we talked about enabling mid band uh, so now if you start looking at you know 2.5 gigahertz you know going up to 5 gigahertz in fact in up to 7 gigahertz and if you still want to be able to have wide area coverage in this bands uh, becomes extremely important that you know you have uh, massive mimo kind of architectures which you know makes up for uh, the increased attenuation you have at these bands so uh, so that's exactly you know what we see with uh, most commercial networks uh, that are going on air right now uh, for this band so uh, massive mimo in place and then uh, finally mobile millimeter wave so this is always you know one of the challenges uh, can mobile millimeter wave be made to work for mobile and uh, you know through our demonstrations and now through our early products we do show that yes it is possible and you know it's uh, it's, it's been uh, done in a very robust fashion so that was uh, release 15 
and then um, uh, so 3 pp is already done with release 16 as well in fact we are on to release 17 right now so what came in release 16 so you know, a couple of things one was you know to take uh, the foundation technology that we had in release 15 and to add uh, you know some key enhancements so for example you know if you look at uh, advanced power saving and mobility you know that's something that was of course already defined in release 15 but then there's always room for improvement especially you know as you start talking about these wide bands high throughputs and uh, if you still want to be able to get all of that in a form factor like a smartphone with a day of use kind of a requirement then uh, power saving and power management becomes very very important but in addition to that release 16 also enabled uh, several new aspects so one of them was uh, uh, unlicensed spectrum, 5G and unlicensed spectrum. So this, this was the first time where it happened. And then um, high precision positioning. So positioning is uh, one feature that we are particularly excited about. And I do have a short uh, clip of a demo that I'll show just a little bit. Um, uh, no, just just because in some sense your cellular and positioning was also enabled in 4G, but uh, you know. The, the techniques that we brought to the table in 5G is something uh, which we feel will really make this happen now compared to some of the earlier uh, generations of cellular technologies. And then uh, mission critical design, uh, especially important for industrial IoT. Uh, so again, we built up on what was already defined in release 15 to be able to get to uh, you know all the requirements that are needed for industrial IoT. And then uh, new deployment models and uh, side link. Uh, so the, again, uh, this uh, the primary use case of side link in, in release 16 was cellular V2X, and this builds on top of you know what we have for LTE cellular V2X. Uh, so we have basic safety messages in LTE CV2X, and then there are enhancements that can be provided with NR-based uh, V2X, and that's exactly what we got with our uh, side link in release 16. And then uh, so uh, 3PP is currently working on release 17. Uh, so the completion was uh, delayed a little bit. Uh, timeline was pushed out because of uh, COVID scenario. Most of the meetings are happening uh, online, but still uh, it, it's it's progressing pretty well, uh, pretty good. And uh, in terms of uh, the key features that we are looking at here, uh, again, you know, there's a, a collection of uh, features that are brought to the table. But I will talk about uh, at least a couple of these in some more detail. Uh, one of them is uh, XR. Uh, so there's a study item on XR and uh, in release 18, we'll actually start making some spec changes. But uh, this is again a very exciting use case for us. And uh, we think you know this is going to be one of the defining uh, features of 5G in particular. So I'll talk about XR and then uh, uh, Maybe another thing to point out here is also you know, what we call uh, NR light for wearables and in industrial sensors. Uh, so maybe I should go to the next slide to uh, point out you know, what we're talking about here. Uh, so uh, in general, you know, when we talk about uh, 5G and we look at uh, you know three different scenarios that we talked about: extreme broadband or EMBB, enhanced mobile broadband, or uh, you know. Uh, Massive IoT or your LLC. So each one of these, it's either uh, at the top, which means in the MBB and your LLC needing the highest performance, uh, which, which also puts you know quite a bit of uh, uh, requirement on how the devices are implemented, uh, what goes in there, the cost of the devices, and the complexity of the devices. And then the other extreme is uh, uh, EMTC and BIoT. So these are solutions that are defined for LTE. But then uh, the early consensus was uh, just given uh, the amount of time that was needed to cover the other scenarios to be able to extend and expand what is already defined for LTE, but define, extend them in such a way that uh, they can be connected to uh, NR networks. So what we see is that uh, there's actually a category in between that can be defined. Uh, for example, if you take a high-end wearable like a smartwatch or a low-end smartphone, where uh, the requirements may be just in between, you know, what uh, we have uh, for EMBP and uh, uh, NBIOT or EMTC, 
and uh, even from cost and complexity point of view these devices fit right in between so that's exactly what's getting addressed right now in release 17 uh, it's officially called uh, reduced capability or red cap and uh, 3pp parlance but uh, uh, when we introduce this notion uh, for us it's really some form of nr light where uh, we design it uh, to the extent where it just about meets the requirements that we have for some of these categories in between. So th this by itself is going to introduce the whole new category of devices uh, in re release 17 and going forward. And then uh, as I said, uh, for massive IoT, the current solution is to take you know, what was defined for uh, LTE, uh, EMTC and NBIoT and uh, connect them to the uh, NR core and NR networks. but uh, going to release 18 and going forward we do envision that nr light that's defined there will also uh, start covering the lower end of the spectrum and then bring in a native nr based solution for mass IoT as well so uh, again a, a quick snapshot so uh, so what we've seen so far is you know uh, and i start off with uh, release 15 with the mpp focus and then Release 16 uh, started with industry expansion, as I pointed out, you know, several new verticals and uh, new use cases were introduced. And then with release 17, so this is when some of the long-term expansion starts. Uh, and then, you know, the timeline is also laid out here in terms of when the standards are getting done and when the commercial products are expected to be available. So this is uh, the technology evolution path that 5G has followed so far and, uh, you know, and the, yeah, how it's projected to go forward from here. But then uh, this is all from uh, air interface point of view. And uh, it's not just the air interface, but uh, the network architecture is also evolving rapidly and uh, pretty much hand in hand with what's happening on the air interface. So if you look at you know, different architectures that are possible for a 5G network, uh, so 5G networks do support traditional RAN where uh, you have your radio and uh, baseband uh, processing units all uh, located at the cell site and then connected using a backhaul to the core hub. Uh, so again, you know, this is how uh, most 4G networks and pretty much all of 3G and 2G was all built out. So this has certain advantages but also certain disadvantages. Uh, uh, so of course, you know, uh, since uh, baseband processing and radio is all in one place, uh, you can have one box in some sense, uh, you know, the deployment model is somewhat defined, but uh, it does not allow for too much of coordination across uh, cell sites and especially any kind of low latency uh, coordination that may be needed. Uh, if you start looking at some physical layer algorithms and uh, related notions, that becomes difficult with traditional RAM. So with 5G now, you know, there is a much, uh, much uh, well-defined support for uh, CRAN or centralized RAN and uh, virtual RAN. Uh, so with uh, centralized RAN, what would happen is you have the radio at the cell site and then now uh, connected with a front all interface to baseband the processing unit, which is uh, centrally located and then uh, going back to the backhaul. So with this, for example, in a, a comp kind of in a, uh, uh, processing can easily be implemented with this. And then uh, going forward, really, you know, the vision here is to be able to get to virtual RAN where, uh, you know, the baseband processing is further divided into uh, a distributed unit and a central unit. And uh, this becomes important when we have uh, massive MIMO kind of architectures because uh, it's talking about at least 64 digital chains or maybe even 128 digital chains depending on uh, the capability and uh, the capacity that's needed from that particular cell site. And when you have that many digital chains, the uh, the capacity that's needed on front hall is again going to blow up. So that, that's where it becomes important to have a good split. And that's not the only reason, there are other reasons, but just to simplify this a little bit. And again, depending on uh, the option that's picked up, uh, there are uh, several ways of splitting what gets done at the distributed unit and at the uh, centralized unit. So again, this is uh, you know, what's happening on the network architecture. So, so while on the network architecture, you know, uh, and then just going one layer above, what 
also becomes important is how 5G is able to handle AI. So AI is uh, pretty much all pervasive right now and uh, sometimes we realize and sometimes we don't even realize that uh, you know most of our applications when we pull up our phone there's quite a bit of AI that's happening right now. And uh, the typical model is that uh, you know uh, there's very little capability on the device at this uh, moment and uh, most of it actually goes deep into the cloud. But uh, this may not be possible all the time and this may not be scalable, especially as we uh, look at you know what's going to happen few years down the lane, especially as we envision every device to be connected, which means that there is so much of data that gets generated and to be able to ship this out all the way deep into the cloud, it's not uh, really scalable, it's not going to be feasible. And then there could be other concerns too. There could be concerns about uh, privacy and security, again, depending on the use case that we're talking about. We may not want the data to leave the premises. There could be some latency considerations, uh, again, depending on the application. We may want inference right away. We may not be able to tolerate all the latency that uh, we would incur if uh, it Do goes deep into the so was there a question? Sorry. Okay, I guess not. Uh, I'll keep going then. Yeah. So, uh, so what five G enables is uh, 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 an architecture where uh, we can actually pick and choose how much of processing happens on the device, how much happens at the edge, and how much actually needs to happen deep in the network. Uh, and again, depending on the use case and uh, the scenario, each one of these may be important. And uh, just as I mentioned, in some scenarios, you may not be able to take the network or you may not be able to take the data deep into the network or for that matter, you know, even allow the data to leave the premises just because of uh, the security and privacy concerns, in which case, you know, you would uh, probably do it all on the edge. And uh, again, to be able to take some of this processing away from the device and to put it either at the edge or into in the uh, you know, deep, deep in the network. It's important that we have a low latency, high reliable connection. That's exactly where 5G enters the picture. Um, and uh, there, there are some examples that are listed here. And uh, I, I just want to touch upon this in terms of how 5G actually has a big role to play in enabling some of the AI functionality as we go forward. So, so again, uh, this is one example where uh, you know all the notions that we talked about uh, for 5G, EMBB, URLLC, and massive IoT comes into picture. So this is uh, you know uh, an example of what we expect to see in the industry of the future or uh, you know industrial IoT. So what you see here on this in the, on, the, on this industry floor is uh, you know the, there is a person walking there with handle terminal and uh, there would be uh, another uh, worker there with a head mounted display getting directions uh, from a remote server or from a, a remote technician about how to operate this machine and then there's computer vision going on. So all of this needs enhanced mobile broadband functionality with uh, high data rate. Uh, relatively low latency kind of uh, requirement and then uh, there are a lot of sensors that are uh, distributed out there which brings in the massive IoT component. Uh, there's the automated uh, guided vehicle that was going on the floor there and then there's the industrial robot with uh, the arms moving around which are all wirelessly controlled. All of this requires ultra reliable low latency and then uh, there's wireless edge analytics going on with all the data that's collected and this is maybe one instance where the industry may not really want the data that it's collecting and working on to leave the premises and all the edge analytics are happening right there. Uh, so yeah, so uh, how do we make sure that 5G for example is able to meet all the requirements here uh, for industrial IoT in this particular example. So what we see is, for example, you know, there is a need for a dedicated network that's optimized for industrial application. There's a need for a scalable platform that's forward compatible. And then uh, the need to provide new capabilities such as, you know, wireless industrial ethernet. So in this, in this particular uh, application, for example, you know, the way 5G addresses this is we have uh, a design for private 5G network 
we have uh, you know, designs for more spectrum options, your LLC, time sensitive networking and positioning. So uh, positioning in particular, uh, I want to touch upon this a little bit uh, to show what 5G brings to the table for positioning. So this is uh, an animation of a demo that we had done uh, at last MWC Mobile World Congress. But I want to quickly play this to point out the new techniques that uh, 5G brings to the table. Um, so uh, traditionally, in even 4G, uh, what we have is uh, what's called uh, the OTDOA based uh, approaches or uh, you know, observed time difference of variables. So what you have here is you need at least uh, two base stations, uh, ideally more than two uh, cells. And uh, when you have two cells or two base stations, what the UE does is it measures the uh, time difference of arrival from these two base stations. And then based on that, uh, you can show that, uh, you know, if you have two observations, then uh, you can put yourself uh, along a hyperbola. And now, uh, clearly, that's not going to be enough. You need to be able to locate the UE uh, uh, more precisely than that. So you need uh, more base stations for that. So, yeah, okay, it's more. So you need that. And then I guess, you know, one other thing to point out here is, uh, so the band here shows uh, the error that you incur in your precision and uh, more the error in synchronization between these base stations, more the error in uh, locating the particular UE. And on top of that, if there's any non-line of sight component, then that adds further to the errors that you see. So you need at least uh, three good line of sight base stations to be able to locate the UE. And then on top of that, any kind of uh, synchronization error between these base stations will actually add on to the uh, error in uh, positioning this UE. So that was always one of the biggest bottlenecks to adopt any kind of uh, cellular solutions because uh, the way these uh, uh, base stations are typically deployed, uh, they're not uh, synchronized to the extent that's needed for positioning. There are some loose requirements on synchronization for communication purposes, but what's needed here to be able to get, uh, let's say, sub uh, five meters or even sub one meter precision, it's not what uh, uh, we're able to guarantee when we deploy the space stations. So, so what's different in 5G? Um, so we have uh, what's called a round trip time based uh, approach where uh, even with a single node, and uh, in this case, it's a massive MIMO node. Uh, so, so, so what we do is we measure the round trip time uh, from the sing single base station going up, going up to the UE. This sounds simple enough, you know, why not do this all the time? But then this does require some calibration both on the G node B as well as on the UE to make sure that uh, some of the implementation uh, delays are uh, taken out or at least calibrated for. So we now have those procedures in place. And on top of that, given that this is a massive MIMO system, you can also locate a UE in the field in angular domain as well. So both in uh, elevation as well as in azimuth. So that by itself, you know, even with a single base station, we're already able to locate a UE precisely uh, in the field. In fact, uh, you know, for some of the line of sight scenarios, we can show that, you know, this uh, error in uh, angle can be made less than half a degree and then uh, you can uh, you know, get this uh, within uh, or less, less than a meter even with a single base station. Now on top of that, if once you have a second base station, that's already good enough once you take the timing as well as uh, angle into account. And uh, this also takes away the other big constraint that I mentioned about. We don't have to worry about no synchronizing the space station since each measurement is with respect to only one of the space stations. So again, uh, this is a quick uh, walkthrough of uh, what's possible in 5G. And this is a technique now that's defined in release 16. And uh, uh, we're working on uh, some demos with uh, some partners and uh, um, uh, we'll have something uh, that, that, that's coming out shortly on this. So that's on uh, positioning. And uh, yet another example, which is uh, really exciting and a uh, good application of you know what 5G can bring to the table is uh, XR. And uh, this is an example of how 5G can enable distributed processing. So XR in particular is very interesting and uh, very challenging uh, uh, just as a use case, if you think about this. 
So what we need to be able to do to enable uh, photorealistic and uh, immersive XR is, uh, and again, if you look at you know the kind of workloads that you have with XR, uh, it's it's compute intensive uh, just to be able to render the scene and the image in a 3D uh, and uh, in the high resolution that's needed, especially given that the glasses are so close to the eye. And then the complex concurrencies, real-time aspect of it, it has to be always on. It has to be sensing, making inferences, and then uh, uh, project, you know, what you see and uh, what whatever augmentation you want to do on top of, uh, you know, what you're seeing out there in the in real world. And on top of that, it's extremely latency sensitive. Otherwise, uh, the users can easily make out that what they're seeing and the augmentation are not going hand in hand. But on the other hand, uh, it's also a very challenging form factor. So it has to be thermally efficient because uh, really the glasses have to be sleek and ultra light. Otherwise, you cannot expect users to put this on and be with these glasses for the entire day. It has to have long battery life for all day use, which means that you know we have to be really careful about how much we put on computation here on these glasses and then uh, storage memory bandwidth and all these other constraints that we can think of. So, so what's the solution for this then? How do we enable a photorealistic immersive XR? So uh, our uh, solution to this is uh, split rendering. And what we mean by split rendering is really uh, do a little bit of uh, processing, which is essential on device, just given uh, you know, that there are these tight latency requirements. Uh, you may just not be able to uh, ship it out and get that done somewhere else, even on the edge. So there has to be some on-device processing, but then also do it in such a way where you are able to at least offload some of the computation to edge and uh, then augment it with what you're seeing on the device. And uh, this is exactly where uh, 5G comes into picture, where uh, you know when you're uh, offloading uh, some of this computation to the edge, uh, you need to have this low latency, high capacity reliable link. And I'll show you a. Uh, uh, short clip of a demo that we have on XR uh, to show what 5G is able to do here. And then uh, just to see how this actually works out, uh, you know, the concept that we talked about. So, so what you're seeing here is a uh, uh, user with an XR headset. Uh, and as I said, you know, this has a little bit of on-device processing. And then there's, uh, it, so this uh, XR glass is connected to a 5G network. And then uh, there is a, uh, a little bit of edge cloud here and then a deep cloud again depending on what needs to get processed at each one of these uh, nodes here. So what you see is uh, so the user has now uh, turned his head a little bit which means that uh, there's a new six of head pose that gets generated. So the, the new pose gets shipped out to the edge cloud using uh, the 5G network here and uh, so the edge cloud now has a new pose and then uh, it knows uh, just based on other camera feeds and uh, other data that's already presented at its cloud, what kind of scene has to be rendered when the, the user is ready to consume this data in few milliseconds away, uh, just when the user has turned his head. And then uh, the new frame is rendered and sent out on the 5G network back to the glasses. Meanwhile, the the on device uh, processing itself still has to make sure that you know while the user is waiting for the data to come back from the edge cloud there is still some rendering that's happened to keep uh, the user occupied uh, there cannot be that lapse otherwise the immersive experience is lost and then uh, when the rendered frame comes back there still has to be some time warping done because there's going to be some latency between when the six star head, uh, head pose was sent out and when the rendered frame came back. So all of this still has to be done with some on device processing. And then uh, again, a careful combination of what exactly gets done on the device and then what gets done on the edge cloud uh, becomes important. How am I doing on time? Think Think again, 15 minutes or so. Uh, sure, we, we, we need some time for Q&A, so Dr. Mokapila, we, we can just maybe five, ten minutes, we can finish it out. Okay, Thanks. sure, maybe I'll take another ten minutes and then I can leave the last five minutes for Q&A. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I wanted to show this uh, demo that we have on um, you know, what we call uh, boundless augmented AR. Uh, 
uh, let me play this out and uh, I'll talk through this as we go through this demo. So, so what we are showing here is a 5G network that we have built here at uh, Qualcomm. This is a test network that we have on our campus. This is uh, operating at 3.5 gigahertz, uh, 100 megahertz uh, bandwidth system that we have. And uh, so, so in the previous frame, you, show, you saw the massive MIMO base station that we have with uh, 64 digital chains, two, in fact, 256 dual polarized antenna elements. It's uh, state of the art. Um, we have in terms of, uh, you know, massive MIMO uh, commercial solutions that are available. And this is our uh, proto solution that we have for a base station. And uh, given the massive MIMO architecture, so we're able to serve a AR user who is about 700 meters away from the cell site. Um, so we'll zoom into the user now. So, and all of this is based on uh, release 15, release 16 uh, specifications. So this user, uh, so what you see is uh, she's wear, wearing an AR glass here and then the interface is through the phone. So the glass in this case does not have a 5G connection. The phone has a 5G connection, but then the glass is uh, tethered to the phone here through the cable in this case. Uh, and uh, the control is uh, through the phone, but uh, the display, of course, the user experience is through the glass in this case. So uh, she gets to a sh uh, shuttle stop here and then uh, she's watching a video. Uh, this so this video is about uh, of course 5G at Qualcomm. And then uh, in the middle of the video, there is a, a pop-up that shows up that there is a, a lecture on 5G. And then uh, she gets more interested in the talk. So uh, she's able to click on a pop-up that comes up which gives her, uh, so, th so the talk is about uh, Massive MIMO and then there's a live model of 5, uh, 5G Massive MIMO that pops up there. So she clicks on that to figure out what uh, Massive MIMO architecture looks like. And she's able to peel the layers, look into uh, different components of uh, uh, Massive MIMO antenna panel. And then she's able to browse through this uh, from different different perspectives and what we're showing here is exactly what the user is able to see but uh, so we captured this using a third person view so so all of this is live so this is all being served on our 5g network as uh, this was recorded and then uh, she gets into the shuttle and as she's getting to her next next stop she's now playing a, a cloud game on her uh, and again uh, rendered in a 3D fashion on her uh, AR glasses here. And uh, the control is through the glass, uh, through the phone, as I said. And what you see here is, uh, again, you know, as the shuttle is going through the campus here, uh, so this is a data rate that's being served for this particular cloud gaming experience. Uh, I think we just missed a frame, but uh, really, so what becomes important here, as I pointed out, is uh, the kind of latency that we have in the network. and uh, of course, the throughput as well, but uh, latency is the key here. And that's really what defines the 5G experience with this kind of an AR application. Then, uh, so, 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 so that was about uh, 5G. So again, as you see, so 5G does have a very well-defined evolution path. So we're going through 15, 16, 17. So really 17 is ongoing right now. It is expected to be completed uh, in the middle of uh, 22. Uh, all uh, physical layer uh, uh, specs will be done by the end of 21 and uh, the spec will be formalized in the middle of 22. So that's where uh, you know, the early release of 5G stand and these releases are going to be mainly focused on really establishing the core functionality and enhancing this core functionality then what we envision is uh, the next three releases 18 19 20 this is what will really uh, start advancing 5g and uh, as part of this uh, this is also what will really set up the platform to bring about uh, you know what's needed for 60 just like you know what happened with 5g and lte advanced so some of the concepts that were used in release 15, uh, especially for upper layers, some of these were defined as part of LTE advanced and they were there just in time for 5G to build on top of that and uh, come up with this big release in release 15, which uh, pretty much encompassed all of what LTE had done over so many releases. We envisioned something similar to happen with uh, 5G advanced uh, leading into 6G. And uh, again, just to 
give a few examples of uh, you know what's exciting and uh, what's on the horizon at this point uh, of course ai and ml and uh, i do hope uh, i'll have a little bit of time to quickly get to that uh, uh, full duplex uh, higher millimeter wave enhanced positioning and uh, again you know i'm sure you've been also hearing a lot of these keywords uh, so we're taking a very close look at each one of these technologies to see you know what exactly would uh, pave the way for advanced 5G and eventually 6G. I do want to spend a little bit of time on uh, full duplex and uh, AI. Maybe a quick demo on uh, full duplex. Uh, I, I, I think I'll, I'll make a quick walkthrough of this. Uh, so uh, full duplex in particular, uh, of course, you know, we've been talking about this uh, for at least uh, 10 years now and there have been other demonstrations uh, for uh, a full duplex. But what is going to be key to enable full duplex in a cellular environment is uh, we need to be able to make sure that we can make this work in a massive MIMO kind of setup with a 75, 80 dBm kind of high power transmitter. Most of the early demos uh, are typically about uh, small cells, maybe 18 dBm Wi-Fi kind of uh, uh, access point. And uh, there are a lot of techniques are possible which we which becomes infeasible once you start talking about uh, 64 chain massive MIMO uh, transmitting at this uh, 75 dBm kind of high power. Uh, so uh, what we have for this is you know, what we call a uh, uh, subband uh, full duplex and I'll quickly point out what uh, what that does. So here what we're showing is you know what typically with a static 3D operation so you have very well defined downlink and uplink slots especially for uh, TD operation. So in a downlink slot, you're going downlink and uplink slot, the, you, the device is transmitting, so you're going uplink, and the entire network is synchronized in this fashion so that uh, there's no interference to deal with. So what we're talking about here is with subband full duplex, talking about actually uh, splitting the spectrum that we have. So for example, if you're looking at 100 megahertz kind of a spectrum, uh, 100 megahertz kind of a bandwidth, then uh, uh, let's say you know we're talking about maybe 20 25 megahertz of that uh, in the middle of the band to be allocated to uplink and then uh, the edges will be allocated to downlink so that first of all this is uh, protected from what's happening on the neighboring operator and on top of that uh, just, just this kind of a split once you have um, this notion sorry i think that, that went through a little too quickly dr mukavili if you can wrap it up please yeah, sure. Okay, maybe I should, I should just do that. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah, and then uh, so want to have a quick slide on AI, uh, AI and wireless. Uh, again, uh, extremely powerful tool, but uh, we need to be careful about you know exactly we're bringing this in, what problems we're looking at to solve with AI, uh, and again you know we need to make sure that we pick the right problem wireless challenge and match it up with uh, the AI strengths that we have uh, to get uh, the best solution. And uh, maybe I'll spend one minute on the slide and then we can just wrap it up. So uh, what we are looking at is essentially an ML enabled air interface design. So at this time, you know, there are uh, proprietary implementation uh, based on uh, ML that happens on the UE side. For like, these are some examples of algorithms that happen right now as we speak. And similarly, there's some that happen on the network side, but really they don't, uh, necessarily work with each other. There may be some notion of data collection and some data exchange, but what we're talking about is uh, to have a joint design between uh, the UE and the g b where we're able to train them jointly, share models, and uh, uh, also have some distributed inference across networks and devices. So this is what we envision. In fact, starting with release 18, we think you know there's going to be a study even in 5G to enable some of these things. And this is eventually, you know, what will set up, set us, uh, set us up for 6G. So with that, uh, this is my concluding slide. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, so what uh, what we think is uh, 5G again is a, a highly enabling platform, and uh, it's built such that uh, first of all, you know, 5G by itself can take on so much more of uh, uh, you know, technology advances, and then in the process, you know, this is really what will build up for 60. Again, the, if, we, if we were to look at history, it's there's a G migration every 10 years or so, and uh, it's likely that you know we'll probably see a similar G migration around uh, 
27, 28 kind of time frame. But then irrespective of that, you know, the 5G platform itself is actually going to give us a long runway to be able to start uh, experimenting with a lot of these emerging technologies. Yeah, with that, sure. uh, I can go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks a lot. Th- thank you very much, Dr. Mokabili. I I think it's a very interesting talk and trying to see how 5G evolving towards 6G. There are a few questions. I know we're running out of time. Yes, maybe uh, one question uh, we have about uh, what really is triggering 6G. This is from Rajiv. And uh, what are the specific use cases you think 6G can take care of? Um, I mean, maybe you can just answer that question then. Sure, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, uh, so, so so one aspect of 6G that gets touted quite a bit and, of course, it's something of interest to us as well is yeah. uh, so this uh, merging of, uh, you know, uh, physical and virtual worlds. So at this point, you know, so we really think of a notion of a digital twin where, uh, you know, so there's everything happening here in the physical world and then, uh, you know, there are going to be sensors which are pretty much capturing whatever is happening with you and then pretty much recreating all of this in the virtual world for you. And then you're seamlessly going back and forth between the real world and the seamless world and your experiences are carried back and forth. And to be able to get to you know, that kind of a user experience, user interface, uh, you know, 5G does take us halfway there, but then we'll need another order of magnitude improvement in some of these metrics to be able to fully get there. So that that's one thank scenario you. that we think of. Yeah. Th- th- thank you, Dr. Mukabili. If you can uh, kindly unshare your um, slide, um, just wanted to say something here. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. I didn't realize I was still sharing, yeah. So, uh, yeah, th- th- thank you very much. It was really an um, interesting talk. Um, I, on, on behalf of uh, Comsnet's organizing committee. Um, we'd like to uh, present this with a virtual plaque. This is going to be sent to your um, address, and uh, in appreciation of your uh, uh, industry keynote talk, this is a token of appreciation that will be sent to your uh, <laughs> um, your house uh, address. Um, uh, we really appreciate you uh, giving a very interesting talk in terms of 5G evolution and how is we are getting into 6G. Uh, so very, very helpful. Appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, th- thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all today. It, it was a great talk. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Hey, Giddy. Um, yeah, so- hey, Ken. Yeah, sorry, sorry, we had to cut the Q and A short, but the uh, other se- the concurrent sessions were starting. But uh, I'm sure you so- understand. Actually, so sorry. Uh, I don't know if I, did I go over the time allocated. Wow, well, it. Uh, I think it's even the previous. All the keynotes have been going over the time allocated. There's nothing we can do because the <laughs> problem is that there's like about a half or a half dozen questions, and you want to get through all of them. Unfortunately, we uh, yeah we. You know, so I wouldn't worry about that. I think it was. I see. Okay. No, actually, so sorry. I was also a little bit messed up with. Uh, I should have just started a timer uh, because with the uh, time conversion. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I think it went very well. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate you uh, taking time from your evening to give the talk. So. Yeah, I mean, feel free to attend some of the sessions too. I think uh, you know. I, I mean, uh, they have some relevant, uh, relevant subject matter. So, <laughs> sure, yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check out to see you know, what else is going on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The, right. the opportunity. It's always you know good to go out and uh, talk about some of the things that we are doing here. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. So we'll catch up soon. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. All right.